have a Bible with you, go ahead and grab that, and let's open it up to the book of First Peter uh, together. They're way toward the back of the Old Testament. Uh, we are, uh, gosh, 63 weeks now into uh, this series where we have really spent the better part of uh, a year and a half, a little over a year and a half, uh, just kind of giving us an, an overview, a, a high level of view, if you will, of the whole of Scripture, all of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And so we are, uh, we are on the back stretch now. And so uh, we're going to go through uh, 1 Peter this morning. We'll hit uh, the, the three Johns. All right, we'll hit uh, those uh, and Jude and then Revelation. And so, uh, Lord willing, uh, we will wrap this series up here at the very end of August together. And then uh, Labor Day weekend, we've got sort of a, a special message. We've been uh, kind of walking through uh, bits and pieces, taking breaks from this series and doing uh, some practicing the way, uh, looking at some spiritual disciplines. And so we're going to talk about the, the discipline of fasting, everybody's favorite right? Uh, everybody's favorite discipline. Everybody loves to fast, right? Uh, and so we're going to be, uh, we're going to be taking a, a look at that. And then uh, that's going to be a, like, you know, Labor Day weekend. I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be out of town. That's fine. But, you know, I encourage you to at least come back and listen to that message. But if you are uh, considering whether or not you want to be here and you're like, are you talking about fasting? I ain't coming now for sure. It's like fasting and money. I'm not, I'm not here either one of those days. Um, I, I'd encourage you to be here because uh, I'm going to uh, set a challenge for us together as a church uh, for prayer and fasting for the month of September. Uh, this past Sunday night during our worship night, I shared some, uh, just some vision for us over the next couple of years as a church. Uh, and um, a lot of you really stepped into that. I've had a lot of great conversations over the last week uh, with a lot of you on, on some of that. And so we want to set our church for the second half of the year going into the fall. We want to uh, sort of lay down a, a challenge for us to, to pray and fast for a certain amount of time uh, over some of these things. And so we're going to do that. And then the week after Labor Day, just kind of giving you a preview of what's happening, uh, we're going to dive into the book of Mark together. All right, so uh, we'll, we'll be doing that the very uh, next week after Labor Day, and we'll be in Mark uh, up until Advent or so, okay? So, uh, so that's sort of the plan coming up, but uh, we just want to just gonna go ahead and dive into this. First Peter today, uh, I'm not going to cover Second Peter today. Uh, in fact, I would just encourage you to go and read that. Not that it's unimportant, it's, it is important, but uh, I, my plan was originally to cover both of these letters uh, today, but as I was uh, laying these out, I felt like just sitting in First Peter would be a good place for us uh, to be so, I encourage you to go and read Second Peter. Uh, we have devotionals uh, for you inside of the U Version Bible app. So you click on More and then Events. Ridge Church should be there, uh, and then you'll get all of today's notes. And there's some devotionals that you can read this week to to help you walk through both of these. Um, but uh, let's let's just go. First Peter chapter one, starting in verse one, uh, gives us a, a like. Paul does in his letters and the other apostles do in their letters, lets us know, hey, this is, this is who is writing this, this is who I'm writing to, and really kind of gives us a little idea about what it's about as well. But this is what Peter writes. Peter says this, he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those chosen living as exiles. So immediately we know two things. Number one, we know Peter is the writer of this, and we, we are talking about Peter of the disciples, close followers of Jesus, one of Jesus' uh, inner circle friends. He's writing this, but who is he writing it to? He says he's writing it to exiles living abroad, uh, and he lists out you know, Galatia and uh, Asia, you know, all these places where they have been dispersed to. Why are they exiles? Why are they dispersed? He is writing to believers, and so these are, these are Christians, these are believers, Christ followers, and they are exiled because this is being written in uh, probably around 65-ish AD, somewhere around there, which is right in the middle of uh, Caesar Nero's reign. And if you know anything about that, you know that there was a, a great persecution that was happening to believers by Nero uh, at this time. And 
for us, like we, it's hard for us to kind of get our minds around, I think, what that persecution looked like because for us, it's like, hey, somebody wrote something bad about me on Facebook, right? That's not it, okay? It's way worse. I mean, they're, they're being put to death. They are being crucified. They are being crucified and burned on crosses. Uh, so it's, it's bad, right? It, it, it's bad. And so these exiles, they are, they are being dispersed. They are being scattered throughout the area, and so Peter finds it necessary to write them a couple of letters. But he goes on, verse 2, it says, According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. And so Peter just, Peter just dives in, right? And again, this is this is this is the Peter that was with Jesus. He is an apostle. That's one of the things that defines an apostle. It was somebody who was actually physically with Jesus, and so uh, Peter has that title. You, you may know of Peter from his other names, though, right? Simon, right? We see the name Simon, Simon Peter, uh, Cephas, right? Which is a, a great name, right? But Jesus Jesus changes Peter's or changes Simon's name because Simon was actually just a, a, a common name. It was a very common name. Not like it's kind of hard to find a meaning of that. Like it doesn't really stick out. Like there, you know, there were a lot of Simons around, right? But not a lot of guys named Peter. And so Jesus changes his name to Peter. And I like that about Jesus, right? Jesus, he just he just calls you whatever he wants to call you. I love that. I do this with my dog. All right, we we have uh, we have a puppy who's 14 weeks old, and his name is Neeland. Right, that that's his name. But when he is acting a fool, his name is Cletus, and I call him Cletus a lot. Um, and so uh, Jesus, like Jesus, just changes people's names on the fly. So why can't we? Right. Um, I feel like Jesus probably calls me Cletus a lot too, though, so it's, it's, probably, it's probably fair. But uh, Peter, the name Peter actually means rock. And so Jesus gives Peter this name. And when we meet Peter, when we see Jesus give him this name, he doesn't really fit the name. You ever met somebody and they tell you their name and you're like, yeah, you don't really look like a Peter, you know, like you kind of kind of think that. Well, of course, in this culture, a name means everything, right? Names meant everything. Like there was, there was deep meaning behind most names. And so when Jesus gives Simon the name Peter, it means rock. And, and what did he tell, what did he tell Peter? Anybody, anybody remember? On this rock, I will build my church, right? Very significant. And so when you think of a rock, right, you think solid, strong, unshakable, foundational, right? Like you you think those things, but that's not the Peter that you get a picture of in the Gospels for the most part, right? It's not until the book of Acts that you see Peter really stepping into his calling, because rock was the opposite of what he was in the moment, but a picture of what he would be, right? And so these letters that that he writes, that he pens, shows a much more spiritually mature Peter, right? We get to, we really get to see Peter transform, because it's not how you start, it's how you what? It's how you finish. It, that old saying really has a lot of meaning to it, especially when it comes to being a Christ follower. It's not how you start. It's how you finish. It's how you are changed. It's how you are matured. And so if you don't feel like you're there yet, then you're in good company. A lot of people in the Scripture, a lot of the disciples, a lot of the apostles, a lot of people that, that we read about, that's their story, right? It's not how you start, but it is how you finish. And so we get to see discipleship in action through the life of Peter. And you kind of see the same thing through the life of the apostle Paul as well, 
right? Like when we first meet Paul, Paul's like, you know, I'm smart, I know things, I can speak different languages, right? Paul says this about himself. He says, I was the, the Pharisee of Pharisees, meaning that I'd achieved everything that there was to achieve success-wise when it comes to these types of things. He's like, I was at the top of the game, Paul said about himself. And then P here's Peter. Peter's a fisherman, which is my kind of guy, right? Peter's like, it's cool, Paul. You know Greek, you know Hebrew, you know Aramaic. That's awesome. I can tell the difference between a bass and a crappie. I like that. I like that. Paul was more of a buttoned-up shirt kind of guy, and I think Peter was probably more of a Crocs and socks kind of guy. But this is Peter, right? Peter has matured, and, and this is discipleship, right? The, the learning from your experiences and, and then teaching that to others. And that's what it means to disciple, to make disciples. And we see this transformation in Peter. And so what does Peter write? What does he write to these exiles? First Peter is sort of a roadmap for Christ followers on how to live holy lives in a hostile culture. It's really the, the, the crux of this. And so how then do we do this? What, what can we gain together uh, from this this morning and, and apply in our own lives? And I think there are four points that I really want to try to cover quickly together this morning, and, and I'm just going to give them to you up front so you know where we're going. But the first one is you need a genuine faith. Secondly, uh, we see the ingredients for holy living. And then third, we'll talk about feeding the right appetite, and then we'll wrap it all together by putting it into practice, putting it into practice. And so the first thing that we see Peter talk about here is he says that you need a genuine faith. Look at what he writes in 1 Peter chapter 6. I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. There are only five chapters. Peter says this. He says, you rejoice in this. I want you to hang on to that word rejoice for a minute. He says, you rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials. There are words that don't fit together in that sentence, Right? You rejoice even though for a little while you're going to suffer. That doesn't feel like it fits together. But he says this, he says, So that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which, though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What does that mean, the revelation of Jesus Christ? That means at his second coming, at the appearing of Christ. Verse 8, it says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him. And you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith. I love that. Peter just says, you want to know what the goal of your faith is? This is it. He says, the salvation of your souls. And so this is what Peter says. He's, he's telling us that it's, it's going to get rough, right? He says, you're going to suffer for a little while. And again, remember who he's talking to. Exiles cast out from their homes, living in exile, uh, away from the persecution of Nero. Right, and he says, he says, but be glad, have joy, he says. How many of you remember the saying, when the going gets tough, the tough get what? Going, right, like, like we know that. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. Peter would say, when the going gets tough, the tough have joy, right? And go, but you also have joy. It's like, what? Last week, um, Wesley Hicks, our executive pastor, he talked, uh, he, he talked through the book of James for us. And James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, uh, he talked about this. He says this, but James writes this. He says, count it all joy, my brothers. He says, when you meet trials of various kinds. What are various kinds? It, everything, right? Trials, storms, tough days, dark moments of the soul, all of these things. He says, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And, he says, let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. 
Now, most of you know that uh, Wes was recently diagnosed with cancer. But what you may wonder is, we all do this, right? How are you really doing? Come on, man. Like, how, how are you really doing? Because we tend to try to fake it till we make it, right? But I can tell you, I can tell you this, I can tell you that, that he's not. He's not trying to fake it till he makes it. Um, he's had some hard moments for sure, but one thing that I've seen in the last month with him is him living this out. Joy in the midst of tough times. Joy in the midst of just a cruddy month, right? In fact, I remember when we were talking on the phone the day that he, he got his diagnosis, we're cutting and making jokes and, and laughing a little bit because that's, that's him. That's, that's how he is. But n- also knowing that, and I remember telling this, the moment that we get off the phone, it's like, you can go cry, aren't you? He's like, yeah, probably. <laughs> it's like, I, I get it. I understand that. Like, that, that makes sense. But this is what James is talking about. This is what Peter is talking about. Right? Tim Keller writes this. Tim Keller says, Christianity teaches that contrary to Buddhism, suffering is real. Contrary to karma, suffering is often unfaith. But contrary to secularism, suffering is meaningful. There is purpose to it. And if faced rightly, it can drive us like a nail deep into more stability and spiritual power than you can imagine. And that's coming from a man who also was diagnosed with cancer and after his diagnosis lived for about three years and recently passed away back in May. He wrote that during that time. And so there, there is always purpose in our suffering for the believer, and that's what Keller is saying. That's what James is saying. That's what Peter is saying. But it, and it reveals and purifies our faith to show its genuineness. Right? Trials do to our faith what fire does to gold. Trials, tough days, tough times, it purifies our faith and reveals its true value and genuineness, which... It really is, right? God purifies our faith with trials by helping us to realize the inadequacy of anything other than trust in him in these situations. And this is what Peter says, right? He says, he says this, he says, he says, your faith is more valuable than gold, which though perishable is refined by fire. And a refiner's fire sounds beautiful, doesn't it? Like we, we put that on t-shirts, we put it on coffee mugs, refine me Lord, refine me Lord, a refiner's fire. Like we, we name ministries that, you know, refiner's fire. But do you understand, <laughs> do you understand what that means? To be put through the refiner's fire? Gold, for example, is purified at 2,150 degrees. That's hot. It's going to be 90 today, and we're like, oh, I can't take it. Refine me, Lord. (laughs) All right? (laughs) Like sometimes, sometimes I don't don't know if we fully understand what, what it is that we're saying. Not that we shouldn't, right? We should want that. We should want that. But what Peter is talking about, he's talking about suffering. And Peter is saying that, that when, the, when the storms come and it, it drives you like a nail, Tell, Keller says, he says, like a nail deep into the heart and love of God, that's when you know you have a genuine faith. I think something that is comforting when I think about this is in that time of trials and suffering is that we know that like us in our suffering, God has wounds too. He has suffered. And there is an intimacy there knowing that, that we both have scars. There's a comfort there in that. If you're looking for that, that comfort in, in suffering and, and, and for a place to rejoice, there, there is that place. And I mean, name another religion where you share wounds with its leader, with its founder. There's not one. 
much less the creator of the universe. And so Peter starts, starts out by saying this to them, hey, you're, you're in exile, you're going to go through some tough times, you're going to suffer, but rejoice! Right? Which echoes the things that Paul said, right? Paul talked about this a lot. In suffering, rejoice. And he says, and I say it again, rejoice, right? He's like, there's, there's joy in this because God's doing something in you. He's doing something with you. He's refining you, and your faith is going to show its genuineness when you just press into him in these times. Secondly, we see the ingredients for holy living, which is really important, especially, it's important for us, but it's really important for them as well, because what, again, echoing back to, like if you go back to the Old Testament, like in Jeremiah 29, we talk about this a lot, Jeremiah 29, where uh, the prophet Jeremiah speaks to the people of Israel who are in captivity in Babylon. He says, while you're in captivity, uh, build homes, plant gardens, live there, like, like plant roots there, but seek the, the peace of the city, right? He says, don't shrink back and don't just go and hide away and put yourself in your little Christian sub-bubble over here where you don't talk to anybody but Christians, like, like get out in the culture, like live this faith out amongst them because it's going to affect them. We talk about that a lot. Peter's kind of saying the same thing to them. He's like, hey, you're in exile. You're in a place that is not not full of believers like you. And so live this out. Live holy amongst the people around you. And so he he gives us some ingredients for this. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here because I think it's fairly obvious what Peter is saying. But let's just read what he says. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 13. Peter says this. He says, therefore, with your minds ready for action, be sober-minded and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There again, he's talking about the second coming of Christ. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance, but as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all of your conduct. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. If you, and he's not talking about himself being holy, he's talking about God. He says, if you appeal to the Father who judges impartially according to each one's work, you will conduct yourselves in reverence during your time living as strangers. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things like silver or, or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. He who was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you, through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Now, uh, if you want to have a holy life, one that reflects Jesus, this is what Peter says. And I think there are maybe a few more here, but I think there are, kind of five big ones here really quickly he says this he says first of all be sober minded what does he what does he mean by that he says he's saying be alert in fact if you go uh just a page over actually two pages in my bible uh in first peter chapter five verse eight he sa- he uses that same language he says uh be sober minded be alert why Because your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. So resist him, firm in the faith. There's that theme of faith again. He says, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. And so the first thing he says, he says, you want to live holy in a hostile culture, be alert. Pay attention to what's going on. Like, don't don't get, don't get sideswiped here understand what is going on around you very good for us today be alert be sober-minded understand what's going on around you like we can't be walking through this life being like i mean you know everybody we just all love everybody it's a christian nation everybody's believers right like it's just the way it is it's not right like we know that be sober-minded be alert then he says this he says be obedient Again, echoing kind of the words of James that we looked at last week where James said this. He says, don't, don't just be hearers of the word, but be what? Doers of the word, right? Don't just hear the word. You got to hear it 
that's important. You hear it so you know what it is, or you read it so you know what it is, but then you got to do it. Like, it's, it's dumb to just hear something and be like, oh, that's so good, that's great, that's great. Are you going to do it? Nah, not really. And so he says, he says, be obedient. Secondly, or third, he says this, he says, he says do not be conformed. And what he's, what he's saying there is, he says, don't be shaped by the culture around you. Influence the culture. Be, uh, be a believer in the culture, but don't be influenced by the culture. And, and Paul would say, say this in Romans, right? He says, he says don't, be, don't be conformed, but be, rather be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? And so Peter, again, is, is just reminding him, it's like, hey, hey, you're a believer, like, don't shrink back, don't go hide away, like, be in the culture, but don't be, don't be conformed by the culture. Live wholly in the culture by being obedient to the word because you hear the word, you do the word, be so reminded, understand what's going on around you. And then the fourth thing he says, he says, imitate the holiness of Jesus. Imitate the holiness of God. Be holy as I am holy. Again, he's just encouraged them, live as holy as you can amongst them. Now, Hopefully we all understand this, we all get this. That does not mean, he says, he doesn't say live perfectly amongst them. You're not going to live this out perfectly. You're going to mess it up. You're going to make mistakes along the way. That's called being a human. It's called being fleshly, if we want to put it in like church words, right? Then he says, says this, the fifth one, he says, he says, do this with reverence. And what he means by that, it, it means to, to have a reverent fear. Not a, not a paralyzing terror, but a, a fear of God's discipline and, and the heavenly Father's displeasure, if you will. Might be a better way to put that. The best way I know to, to illustrate this is... Um, Growing up, I, I wasn't afraid, I was never afraid of my, of my dad, but I had a healthy reverence for him, you know what I mean? Like, I had a, a healthy reverence for my father, and I, I had a healthy reverence of his fatherly displeasure, <laughs> because I knew what that meant for me, right? That was the sound of a leather belt going through belt loops, you know, at a very high rate of speed, making a whip sound, at, you know? You just, you just hear that. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. I did not get put in time out. Um, but uh, so I had this, you know, I had this healthy reverence for him, but not a, not a terror or a, or a fear. And, and Peter, Peter is saying the, the same thing. He says, with, he says, live holy with reverence. And then he says this in verse 17. He, sa- he says, Li- live as strangers. Living as strangers. He says, during your time, living as strangers. And this is, this is how you show a hostile culture that you are set apart, that you are different. And I, 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 we don't have time to unpack it. We don't have time to get into it. But, I mean, I, hopefully, I, again, this goes back to being sober-minded and alert. Hopefully, we understand this. We live in a hostile culture. As believers, we do. That's the reality. And so what Peter is writing to them, he is writing to us. This is, this is for us. And so the way that we transform and grow in holiness in order to, to live a holy life is, is number three. How do, how do we do that then? Like, like what's, what helps us there? What transforms us there? And that's number three, that's feeding the right appetite. Right, the appetite is the one that desires holy living, and so therefore we need a desire for what the scriptures call the bread of life, the word of God. Look at First Peter chapter one, verse twenty-four. I promise we're going to get out of chapter one.
where we live, work, and play, right? Who are not believers. And so I, I hate to bring up old stuff, but um, 2020 was something, wasn't it? If you ever want to relieve tension at a family dinner, you know, things are kind of, maybe pe- people are getting a little snippy with one another, maybe arguing around the dinner table, something like that. Like, just throw a grenade and be like, hey, how about that 2020? And then just walk away, right? It's, it's great. Either bring that up or politics. One of the two, right? But if 2020 showed us anything, it showed us that, that we are more divided and splintered than we have ever been, right? We, I mean, we were already pretty divided, but, but found even more ways to divide in 2020 than, than we ever had before. Right, science, no science, mass, no mass, lockdowns, no lockdowns, conspiracy theories, politics, race. Carol Baskins may or may have not have killed her husband, we don't know. Or maybe we do know. Right, and so I, I, I don't think that I'm alone in this, but I, but I felt a lot of devices, divisiveness and judgment around me, but in some ways even in me. But I'm guessing I'm not the only one that struggled with this horizontal relationship part of that during that time or maybe even still today but here, here's what i know to be true about that is that satan would love nothing more than to divide believers any way that he can and he did a, he's, he's he's done a great job he's doing a great job he was already doing a pretty good job if you want to get a, a sort of a um i guess i would call it a in a way, a a fictional view of that written back in the 60s, read C.S. Lewis's Screw Tape Letters. Because what he wrote then actually is so true today. It's scary. The the schemes of Satan, if you will. So here's what I, again, I I know that to to be true. And so what does it look like for believers to display unity in a divided world and be united amongst division? Because this is what these exiles are also dealing with. And Peter tells them, and he tells us, he says, first of all, he says, be like-minded. Be like-minded. He says, be unified. Have a common vision. Get on the same page. Like, that's a great start for believers. Can we not just get on the same page about foundational things we can disagree about open hand gray area type things that's fine we can disagree about that but can we disagree about those things and be like i still love you because i know that we both love jesus like we got to get there we ain't there but we got to get there peter's saying be like-minded be unified be sympathetic toward each other and love one another while being compassionate and humble Could you imagine, I mean, think about this, imagine the influence on our culture if just we as believers, I'm not talking about everybody else, people that aren't believers, like, whatever, right? But I'm just talking about we as believers. Could you imagine the influence on our culture that we could have if we actually lived this way? Just among one another. We're unified because it is, it's, it's just about Jesus. He says, be compassionate and humble with one another, not repaying evil for evil or being insulting. Instead, he says, be a blessing. And so Peter continues to point this out with more practical ways to, to show what's inside of you. Look at what he says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. He says, the end of all things is near. He says, therefore, be alert and sober-minded. That's the third time that he has said that. Be alert and sober-minded for prayer. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, since love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Just as each one has received the gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of the very grace of God. And if anyone speaks, let it be as one who speaks God's words. Keep the main thing the main thing, he says. Paul talked about that. He says, if anyone serves, let it be from the strength God provides so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. 
Amen. I think Peter meant to end the letter there, but he's like, oh, yeah, wait, 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 one more thing. (laughs) Just imagine the message this would give to the unbelieving world around us by living this way. And so Peter closes his letter with this great promise. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, he says this. He says, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you. And isn't that great? After you have (laughs) suffered a little while. (laughs) What? It's like, you had me until that part, Peter. Four verbs, restore, confirm, strengthen, establish. Right? It reminds believers that God will eventually restore what we have lost for the sake of Christ. Though suffering will come first, it will be followed by eternal glory. And Peter says, the God who called believers by his grace will fortify them with his strength, so that they are enabled, listen, to endure to the end. And then in verse 11, he ends showing us that because God is sovereign and rules over all believers, that's us, if you're a Christ follower, believers, and we have nothing to fear as we live this out in a hostile culture. And that's the letter of First Peter. So we're going to pray and uh, take a moment to just reflect on the word for just a second and um, do a couple of things. Uh, first thing is, is we have communion available, as we do each week. And, and again, uh, the, the table is open to believers. The table is not Ridge Church's table. This is, this is the Lord's table. And so as believers, we can partake together. You don't have to be a member here. We don't even have a membership here, so that, that wouldn't even matter. right? But, so we invite you to come to the table as a believer. But before you come to the table, that we take just a moment as we sing a song together to, to close our time out together. And then we're going to do baptisms right after that. But that that we would consider the word. What, what step do you need to take? What, what, what push in a direction do you feel the, the Holy Spirit moving you this morning to, to take a step and that, that you would pray through that, that you would lay it before the Lord, that you would ask him, God, God, what is my next step? What would you have me do with what you have spoken to me about this morning? And that we, we take the time to do that and then we come and we take the, the bread and the juice, the body and the blood of Christ broken and shed, given for us, so that, so that we can have that relationship with Him, so that we can have salvation through Him, and it is only through Him. And so as we, as we sing, as we take this time to, to pray together, to, to sing and, and, and praise together, uh, I would just encourage you to take that next step. And if baptism happens to be one of those next steps, then I, I would just encourage you to do this. Like, it's hot outside. It's going to be 90-something degrees today. You just go home wet. I'll get in the water back there with you. If you are a Christ follower, but you've never been baptized, I would encourage you to take that step to be baptized today. You're like, how do I do that? What do I do next? Just come up here. Like, just come sit on this front row right here. and we'll be like, we know what's happening right there. Better call my wife tell her to bring me an extra pair of pants. All right, so um, let's do that. All right, pray with me. Father, we are grateful and thankful to uh, be in your presence this morning. God, we pray that uh, your word has sunk deep into our hearts, God. God, that it continues to to put down roots, to bring forth fruit, Father, so that that we can live holy lives, that we can exhibit a a genuine faith, God, that we can even live amongst each other, understanding that that you are the foundation of all things, and if we can gather around this this commonality and be be unified in you, God, that, that we can show the world around us that that it is all about you. And in the secondary things, God, Lord, just help us. Lord, if there are specific things that you're calling out in our hearts, God, give us the faith to take a step forward. God, give us the faith to lay things down at your feet to, to repent, God. That if anything stands in the way of having a desire and a yearning for your word to help us grow, God, that you would bring it forth to our mind. 
And it's in your name we pray. Amen. And will you stand to your feet as we continue to sing? You can, you can stay seated as well if you like to, to just continue to pray, but we just encourage you to take your next step.